ESPN's Jay Billis with me, David Smoke on 365 Sports. Jay, I saw an audio clip of your conversation about body of work and what it means in this day and age. Is it more about because the conferences have become so expanded that you don't have to have those three to four or five quality non-con games to make a difference? Well, I mean, it depends on what body of work means. Like, I think the the non-conference schedule strength was an issue when they they felt like they wanted to encourage you to go out and challenge yourself. But if you're challenged in your conference uh, enough, what's the point? Otherwise, you're not saying total body of work. Um, I, I don't get it. Like, if you're looking at a team and you're determining one team is better than the other, um, you should be able to do that. If you can't do it by, um, you know, sort of their record and then what you see from them and how they've improved over the course of the year, how they're playing now, how they played early, things like that, and you have a tie, you say, we can't distinguish between these teams. We're going to have to make it the distinction somewhere else. Then if you want to say, okay, well, this team beat more teams than the other one. Uh, it has two more quality wins. Then, okay, that's fine. But if you can't look at the teams and say who's better, um, that's that's the way to do it. But, uh, you know, I, I happen to think Pittsburgh was better than four teams that were in the field firmly, not just bubble teams. And uh, and I think the committee, you know, they do it every year. They make a mistake here and there. Uh, I guess we should expect it. But uh, I, I don't feel I, – I feel they need to change the way they do it because it's become very formulaic. That's why these bracketologists are – you know, saying I got 67 out of 68 when they give themselves the 32 automatic qualifiers. You know, you're really talking about the difference in, in you know, five or six teams at the end of the line. Can you see the uh, what, what, what's your thoughts about the tournament expansion discussion? Is that a good thing, bad thing? What's good about it or not so good about it? Well, it's not good or bad. It's just a question of, of what's best. And uh, look, I think the field is big enough. Uh, we start getting down to, you know, 74 teams or whatever they're talking about or 96. Um, you're just throwing banana peels in the in the way of the best teams. And this is supposed to be a national championship event. Um, I, I, just because Division One is really big doesn't mean that every team deserves access to the tournament. They already have access. All mm-hmm. they have to do is win their, win their conference automatic bid, which is, you know, every conference gets an automatic bid. I don't think that's the right way to do it, frankly. Some of these conferences don't play at a level where you're saying, all right, one of your teams deserves a shot to win, you know, to compete for the national championship. It just, you've got all these conferences. They've never won a game. And, uh, and that's not nat- national championship quality to me. So we don't have the best 68 teams in any given year. We've never had it. We never will if they keep doing it like this. Nobody can, nobody can complain that it's not fair. Because everybody's got the same shot to, to get their automatic bid against their peers in their own league. Greg Sankey continues to discuss how the power or autonomy schools should get more and not so sure that the Cinderella's are always um, a great idea. Isn't what March Madness, even though it's going to end up being a, a seven or eight teams that probably play that last weekend with the exceptions, isn't March Madness greatness and excitement and all that about that first weekend and seeing the shocking upsets or not? Well, it, it, it's up to each individual person to, to make that. Like, and people say that all the time. This is what makes college basketball great, or this is what makes the NFL great. It's never just one thing. It's a whole bunch of things. So it's a, it's a, a fun first weekend. Um, but, you know, even if you look back at some of the, the runs that the, the quote-unquote Cinderella has had, um, some of them actually weren't Cinderella. They were really good teams that we talked about all year long. But, you know, I, I find it hard pressed for, for a lot of even the most passionate college basketball fans. Like, name, name me a player from last year's Fairleigh Dickinson team. They can't mm-hmm. do it. They, they couldn't even name the coach. And, uh, and it's not, you know, it's, I think it's great the way it is. I'm not arguing to, to cut anybody out. But when, when these big conference commissioners are looking at this going, you know, our, our sixth best team in our league was twice as good as, as some of these teams get in here. That, that's what they're looking at. And they, they want that access for some of their teams to be able to do these kind of things. And, uh, and that's where the rub is. And, 
Look, it's about money, too. They want the money from us. There's a lot of money changing hands in this tournament. You get in, it's a couple million dollars. You win a game, it's a couple million dollars. Uh, they want, you know, they want access, but they also want the money. When you're in a conference, and the Big 12, of course, is who we cover, I cover the most, but the other ones that can be a battering ram because of the depth and whatever, and amount of games played, is that when a tournament starts kind of a relief to play somebody else, or could they be worn out before it starts? I don't, I don't really subscribe to the get worn out theory. Um, some teams are energized. Some teams are tired. It happens to everybody. Some teams are beat up, injured. Um, there, there, are, there are a lot of different scenarios that, that go into this. And it's a double-edged sword with seeing somebody else. You know, you, you get in your conference, everybody knows what you run. They know how to stop it. You, you've got to have counters and, and second and third options for every play in your multiple a- actions. Um, but when you play against some of these smaller teams, smaller conference teams, you watch them on film, they're not going to play that way when they play you. They play with reckless abandon, and a lot of these teams play sometimes their, their very best games because it's, uh, you know, they're, they're at a level of, uh, of excitement and you know they're playing with nothing to lose, things like that. Those teams can be hard to play against. And if you're not used to seeing a certain player, you, know, you may not get used to what that player does when you've seen it with with the teams you've played against. So it's a double edged sword there. When we discuss the uh, the money disparity and that has been discussed as far as the the power schools and football, obviously is like man, they're they're fast tracked down the road. Could any kind of disparity in how the money is distributed to conferences in basketball continue? Will that lead to more poaching of the mid majors or not? I don't know what poaching means. Um, uh, transfer they, portal, uh, finding players from the mid-majors. Is basketball different, you think, when it comes – Not there's as many people, if not more, that get in the transfer portal in basketball because it's 350-plus teams. Do you feel like if the money disparity continues with the larger conferences, it could lead to even more players going to the bigger schools, or is that just part of life? It's part of life. And, uh, you know, I look at the transfer portal as an opportunity. Like, why should a player who was recruited at the mid-major level out of high school and proves to be better than that that uh, level of, of recruiting or that level of play, why should that player be relegated to that level for the rest of his career? Um, you know, would, it, would everybody in Waco feel better if Ray J. Dennis had to play his entire career at Toledo? Mm-hmm. Um, he, he's better than that. And uh, it, the coach at Toledo, like, you know, Scott Drew didn't come he come to Baylor from the NBA. He came from a, a smaller school. You know, he was an assistant at Valparaiso and all that stuff. And uh, so the coaches have an opportunity to better themselves and to take a step up. And I, I just don't see why the players shouldn't be allowed to do that. The one solution to this, if people don't like to transfer for it, is just find the players to contract. You have to pay them directly. And the NCAA doesn't allow that yet. So that's what created the transfer portal. Um, if the players had contracts, they would they would say if they wanted to stay at say, like take Ray J. Dennis. If, if Toledo signed him to a four year deal, he'd still be at Toledo. He could have said, uh, "No, I'll sign a two year deal with an option for the last two. But after two years, if I if I want to transfer, I've got to be able to do that. Maybe they pay him a little bit less. Who knows? But it's a it's just business, and uh, and I, I think that would make everything a lot easier." You have been outspoken about the NCAA in many, many ways. A lot of people have. Do you feel like what they're going through now with almost mass chaos, something that they deserve or earned because of their arrogance of who they were? Well, first of all, there is not chaos. Not one game has been canceled. Not one check has gone on cash. Okay. This is going on just fine. There's no chaos here. Some people don't like it because it's different than what they had. But all of this is the NCAA put all these rules in. The transfer portal didn't appear out of space. They created it. Um, so they knew what they were doing. And, uh, and so, I, I mean, I, I get it that some coaches don't like it because it was a lot easier before. And, and they, could, they could say my way is the highway. And there was no highway. Now they say my way is the highway, and there's a highway. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I don't see this as being chaos. I see this as just being the natural consequence of the decisions the NCAA, the NCAA has made. But uh, it's pretty clear that everything's headed in a direction that they don't want. They don't want to pay the players, but they're going to. I think some people in the system know it. 
but uh, they're unprepared for it mentally and otherwise. Um, but they've got the trains headed right at them uh, as far as lawsuits are concerned, and they're going to lose a lot of money in these lawsuits coming up. The last lawsuit was about academic resources. The next ones are about money. And just like they lost the last one, they're going to lose all the cases coming up. Jay, uh, today Clemson filed a lawsuit against the ACC uh, about the grant of rights and all of that. We know what Florida State has done. What are your thoughts about where we're going with college football? Well, it's just college sports, period. Um, You know, these these schools want to make decisions. They don't want to be locked into a conference when there are better opportunities elsewhere. And uh, so they're complaining about the transfer portal, but they want to leave where they are, which I find, you know, completely laughable. But, um, you know, we could see this is going to change even more going forward. And uh, at some point, will we have, uh, you know, one bigger division? We, we could have that. But one thing I know is that, uh, that whatever has been done in college sports, uh, people continue to consume it. You know, everybody at the NCAA said to start paying players, people are going to stop watching. And they didn't stop watching. Ratings are higher than ever. Um, so I don't have any doubt that this is going to continue to go in a positive direction from interest uh, to value. And right now, I mean, if you listen to people in private equity, they'll tell you the college sports is undervalued. Uh, so we're we're uh, we're going to see this continue to go in a positive direction. Question for you: You mentioned Ray J. Baylor has like the six best, based on all the data, analytics, whatever offense, but their defense has really just been shredded, like in nearly three hundred ranking. What would you rather have, a higher ranked defense or a higher ranked offense? If the other one was on the other spectrum. Yeah, well, I'd rather have both, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd rather I'd rather be able to score. You know, you're not going to pitch a shutout in the NCAA tournament. Um, and I think yeah, I think their defense can improve. I know, you know Baylor's been playing a little bit more zone. That's been helpful at different times. And uh, as these Mises continue to get better, blocking shots and a, a, a force inside, uh, that can help improve things. But, uh, yeah, if I had to choose between being able to score uh, or, or just being able to stop people from scoring, I'd, I'd choose score any day. We're starting the tournament basically today. Is this Christmas for you in any way? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I love it. Uh, it's the national championship, so we're going to find out uh, within three weeks you know, who the national champion is. And I tend to look at this tournament a little bit differently than some other people. You know, they get their brackets out and they're interested in upsets and all that stuff. I want to know who the best teams are. This is this is how to identify the best teams. And uh, you know, Sweet Sixteen is great, but uh, but you remember who the national champion was. Jay Billis, ESPN on 365 Sports. Appreciate Jay's time.